anything worth posting. Okay. Um, so yeah, on, on Monday, um, Jeff posted some slides and I was going to give like a two minute response, but, but that was going to provoke a longer conversation. And so this is like an informer, informal follow-up, just acting as if Monday's meeting never ended. Do you and, want me and, to put those slides up again? Uh, no, you don't have to. Cause, okay. uh, I, cause w during that last meeting I sat and drew what I would have written on an, on a whiteboard, uh, on Monday. So I, I'll project that now. I'm right. On, right. On, this is, I didn't use a physical whiteboard. I used a uh, electric whiteboard known as an iPad. Just a second. I've been debating whether I should do that or not. Yeah, I've been I've been using that uh, some in some of my meetings. It works quite well. So uh, yeah, and and with Zoom, you can well okay. At least on a Mac, you can plug your iPad directly into your, I know, into your laptop and project it like this as I'm doing. Um, so. Uh, this is not this 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 doesn't meet my usual bar of of thinking deeply about a thing and presenting a finished thought. This is what I would have said Monday after your uh, after what you you said. So, but just like uh, saying back to you, uh, you, so on Monday you talked about uh, flow inputs to cortex and and that being something that's kind of fundamental and part of and like deep layers of cortex are maybe uh, recognizing flow inputs or or uh, representing flow inputs and such. Um, and I just wanted to. Um, to kind of map this onto, uh, it's just, I'm just saying it back to you in, in different language and, and, uh, and yeah, applying it to two different spaces. Uh, when we talk about cortex, we're often using something analogous to what I've drawn here is this, um, the rat in the room. Uh, and that's, that's, that is physical space. That's the, uh, uh, that's, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the baseline for all of this. I think one of your motivations for not having a motor input uh, by required um, is that that um, you want to be able to apply this uh, circuit, this algorithm to more general spaces like conceptual spaces. And, uh, and once you no longer require a motor input, that makes the system kind of more powerful in what it can represent or how it can build. Do you want me to, I, I, you might add a couple more thoughts of that? Is sure. That right? Yeah. yeah go ahead. Um, it wasn't like I wanted to get rid of the motor input. It was the motor input was always a very problematic thing for me. I always felt that a cortical column would have no way of interpreting an efforts copy motor signal from someplace else. It, it, it just wouldn't know what it is. It wouldn't know what it means. It has, had to be learned somehow. It was a, it's not something you could know up front. Um, and so that was a problem. And similarly, the motor output of a cortical column it, it couldn't know what it's supposed to represent. And, and so that had to be learned too. So the, the whole motor mapping, the efference copy motor output was always a problem for me uh, because it, was a, it, was, it had to be a secondary step after some other learning occurred. And then I think your right point you're about to make here, what you just made, was that the motor output is also something that's a little problematic to think about when you get the higher level of the cortex. Um, and although we always talk about every cortical column in the cortex having a motor output, uh, you know, the, the person who really argued that to me was Mary Sherman, but he always qualified it saying, well, everywhere we looked, now everywhere they, we know that there's layer five cells everywhere, but we don't really know that every layer five cell projects subcortically. We do know they project to other places in the cortex. So the idea that some parts of the cortex may actually not, not be mapping to physical motor things was another issue. So all right, I'm just adding on to what you said there. Uh, so w what I've drawn here is like, as yeah, the, the baseline space of, you know, uh, of a rat in a room or a sensor moving a, a, in space around an object. Uh, and there you have this, uh, there, there is a subtle difference between the two spaces I've drawn here. It's not, maybe it's not even that subtle. The second one with like this bird space uh, with the stretchy necks, legs, birds being mapped into a physical space. Um, with that one, the directions of movement are um, there's no notion of egocentric. There's you you move in neck space and you move in leg space. There's no notion of is it in the space of the body or the or, or the or the um, the you know these the reference. These frame. are abstract dimensions. That you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so like I could have so on the bottom row of this, I drew I draw the flow arrows and they correspond. <laughs> they're relative to the body of the rat. Uh, it's maybe I should have used different, uh, not a non-living object on the right. It, it makes things a little confusing. This is this is a conceptual space. But uh, I, I think it's pretty clear. At least yeah. Uh, so the, the the for the for the left column here, um, I could not draw those arrows 
in the space itself. If I had drawn the arrows in the space itself, it would have been confusing because the arrows need to be egocentric. Yeah. Uh, but on the right column, the arrows could have been drawn in the space itself. They, they're just they're just parallel to neck length and leg length. Uh, and so th th anyway, the whole egocentric thing can confuse the conversation sometimes. So that's, that's how, I, how I drew it here. I feel like it's not that important of a thing. It just really confuses the conversation. But it, the well, there is, there is still a very important question, which I was alluding to Monday, which is we have, we have yet to figure out how to get from egocentric to allocentric space. Um, eventually it has to occur. So um, uh, that's an important point. It's worth mentioning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, that conversion has to occur. And I was starting to talk about that on Monday when I was talking about perhaps there are two different the upper layers and lower layers and the upper layers modeling movements of an object and the lower layers model movement of the body. And um, I, I, I was hinting at that problem. I'm, I'm really thinking about that problem a lot. So, uh, so I'm, I'm attracted to um, the, the problem space of, um, of how do you learn these spaces, these, uh, these spaces like I've drawn here, um, e even if you don't have a motor input, can you do it just by, first of all, the most extreme case, if you just have a pure sensory input that doesn't even have a flow component, it's just sensory input, can you learn the equivalent of a space like this? Um, and then what happens when you do add something like a flow input, that's sort of um, sort of helping the system learn. So, so here's the second set of things I drew. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, so, yeah, here, I literally wrote this like ten minutes ago, and uh, the handwriting's bad. But um, so more generally, um, kind of a, a a point of view here. One way you could choose to frame all this, not necessarily the right one, is um, is so assume your sensor. This is kind of in the um, kind of in the language of how I'd describe this if I were um, putting this in a more mathematical um, framework. Uh, so, but it's really different words for the same thing. Um, assume the sensory inputs can be mapped to a low dimensional Euclidean space or a low dimensional manifold. Uh, and here, this is the equivalent of like our maps or reference frames. Uh, and, and so these sensory inputs, they might be nearby on the map, but they might be very different from each other. Here I've drawn three sensory inputs. I didn't do anything to indicate it, but one and two might be very, very different from each other. And one and three might be very similar to each other. And so so um, instead, what is the, the distance on this manifold or the dist distance in the space? Um, one way to one way to do that, that this that has been shown to work uh, where you can where you can sort of learn these spaces is if you just use time as a supervisory signal where the distances between inputs are proportional to the time between uh, when you experience them. And, and of course, you don't have to learn, you don't have to learn all pairings. You don't have to learn the timing between one and three. It's more transitive. You, you learn the timing between one and the space around it, and then two in the space around it, and it all just kind of works transitively. Uh, so, so some people even study grid cells with this question in mind of, um, of are they actually learning temporal spaces? And it's just the, the fact that, um, that these rats are moving around these box-shaped rooms uniformly, and that's what gives you the, these nice grids. But in, but in the end, maybe it's all learning a, um, a, a, a Euclidean space like this and using timing as the, as the supervisory signal. Uh, can I, can I so, just throw out a, yeah, go on. ideas that are popping in my head as you're talking here? Um, I don't know if this is useful or not, but I've, I've started to think about these spaces. You know, initially when I thought of these spaces, oh, you can think of it like, you know, a Cartesian coordinate or something like that. You know, you've got this X, Y, and Z and so on. But I've started to think about them differently. I've started to think about the spaces that are defined by movement. That is, they are movement spaces, which, uh, which can be mapped onto physical spaces. But if, if, my, if my primitives to, the, to a cortical column are flow bits, it is, in some sense, it's, those flow bits are, rep and I'm processing them, they basically, what I'm dividing up the space is the different movement primitives. So I, the only model I can build in the world is a model that of, of the parts I move through. I can't model any parts that I can't move through. And um, it's just a different way of thinking about it. it it's, it's a way of thinking that um, um, the, the space themselves is a movement space. We've, we've united, and so it unites movement with, with the space and with the sensory input at the same time. I don't know if this is being clear. Um, uh, but I, I've moved away from thinking about them like, oh, this is a direction in the space that's meaningful 
on its own right. You know, it's only a meaningful direction if the animal moves in that direction. If the animal never moves in that direction, it doesn't exist in some sense. <laughs> um, I know that's, it's, it's just a, it's a thought I wanted to share with you. I don't know if it made sense if you followed that or not. Um, but what you just said reminded me, I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, because, oh, I know why, because movements are always temporally uh, co-adjacent, right? You know, you don't randomly jump around places. You always move through space to get someplace. Um, and so there's always an implied, when you're moving in a dimension in this space, you're, it's always time-based uh, because the animal has to, or the thing has to physically move in that direction. Or in higher cortex, of course, you're not physically moving, but in the lower sensory cortex, you can physically move. I'm, I think I'm just saying what you said, putting different words on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just have these two bold bullet points remaining, and then I'll just open it up for general discussions. Oops. So, um, yeah, two thoughts, two reactions based on what I've drawn here and what we've talked about. Uh, having an actual flow input, if you can, like, just for free, sort of, if I just give the system for free uh, this, this, SDR that activates whenever you move left and an SDR that activates whenever you move right or something along those lines. Um, it makes this learning problem easier. Uh, it, it, but I can flip this around and say, Well, can um, you explain why it makes it easier? Or what, what you're thinking behind that? You, sure. Uh, if you had a set of cells that they're, ju they're just like opaque cells, they're like um, movement direction cells, similar to head direction cells, but they're movement direction cells. Uh, then using that, uh, if you don't, well, it's, it, maybe it's easier to say if you don't have that, learning how to map your sensory inputs into just an, a, a Euclidean space is a hard problem to solve. Uh, you, but once you have these flow inputs, you're essentially receiving a label for the, your you're saying, directions. It, you're saying maybe flow is your time co-adjacency? Is that what you're saying? Is that your supervisory signal? Is it, uh, that the flow itself is a supervisor. Yeah. Or maybe. Uh, is um, uh, uh, let's see. As you're mapping sensory inputs into this space, uh, there is ambiguous where to map them, but it's not as ambiguous once you have a flow input. I agree with you. I was trying to get scratch down below the surface and try to figure out why, why exactly you said that. Because <laughs> you might have a different, you might have a different way of deriving that same insight as I did, different than I did. I just, just seemed if I could, that's all I was asking. I mean, I agree with your statement. I yeah. just, I just wanted to, what was your, your, um, you know, your uber thinking that led you to that, you know, what was your visualization of that? that, told you that? I, so if, if you, um, if you move to the right, it, and you, okay, no, sorry, let me say this different. If, if a flow cell activates, and not, un, unbeknownst to you, that flow cell represents, I moved to the right, but it's just an opaque flow cell. Uh, and then it happens again. Uh, you know exactly uh, where in the map to map the second sensory input. It's, it's like there's ambiguity on the first one, but not on the second one. Okay, well, so that, that's a little bit just sort of like our whole sensory motor model that we did in the columns paper then, right? It's like, okay, we have these sensory inputs coming in, but we can't really make sense of them unless we know what the movement command is. Is that similar to that idea? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So the final thought is now just taking that uh, first bullet point and inverting it. Um, if you can learn these spaces using just the temporal trick, then once you've learned the space, it can be it can give you these flow labels. It can give you uh, the ability to detect flow. Oh wow! Wait a second. I thought you used flow to detect to build the space, but now you're saying I'm now I build the space. I can use it to, to detect. Well, in, in principle, you can build it without flow if you just use the temporal adjacency trick. If if you just but, but that seems almost like a, um, a combinatorially impossible problem. Um, you know, you, you're basically saying, oh, I can just watch how these different bits change over time. And from them, I have enough information to deduce the underlying structure, which may be true, but the, the, the number of ways that it, just, it might be computationally impractical to figure out how to do that. 
uh, but flow gives you this structure. Flow gives you these like dimensions of the space. And then all of a sudden you can say, oh, well, you know, I can now say that I'm moving right. Therefore, I can eliminate all these other possibilities that you know, could have happened. Or something like that. Um, so what, what other to me, people... I just, would you disagree with that? That is like almost computationally impossible to... Well, no, well, other, other people would respond to this with that, um, that if they, they would, let's see, heavy in learning is similar to principal component analysis. And principal component analysis does solve this problem, basically, where it, uh, if you have cells that are, um, that are, uh, let me try to say this uh, precisely, not, not, not overcomplicated language. Uh, so if you have cells that are, I'm sorry, I would, I'm not prepared for this. Uh, heavy in learning is like principal components. Principal components of, of, of location are grid-like. Uh, six months ago, I would have done better at this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so that's. Um, I get. I, I don't know. Well, I, I, have I, a, I have another question about some of this. Um, well, uh, this is a small question, but. In the case of images, you know, how, how would you incorporate things like different distances because uh, and uh, or maybe speed of movement and things like that? That's those, those are seems to be additional dimensions that somehow have to be incorporated. Yeah, into recovering uh, the manifold. I agree. Or whatever. I, I agree, but I think that that can be accounted for. I think that you can. I agree that this this is kind of a cartoon version where you, it's almost like all all things move equally. It's like the speed is constant. If I hold the speed constant, this works. Once speed can change, it becomes more complicated at the same time. In the end, it averages out and works out. And, uh, you know, you, that, you're that talking could about, explain- You're talking about speed of movement, the, velo the actual uh, velocity of the movement, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, if, I, yeah. If, you, if you use time as the supervisory signal, then it starts to become kind of strange because sometimes you move quickly sometimes you yeah. move slowly. I mean that's you know this is, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of work thinking and deeply trying to think deeply about the whole um, you know good cell path integration problem trying to get a, like a, a deep understanding of all the different models and how they relate to each other and you know the, and one of the things that you get of course from that at least all the variations of the oscillatory uh, interference models um, is you get the sense that uh, the path integration takes or automatically takes account of the speed um, that um, I don't know how best to say that, but you know, if I had a if I had a, a mini column that represented direction and one movement in a particular direction, the scalar activation of those cells in the mini column would represent the velocity in that direction, and that would change the oscillator, the voltage controlled oscillator, and that would basically uh, then the whole space the, it, it it abstracts out the speed component, so you do path integration correctly based on different speeds. Um, so I, I just find that that's one of the nice things about the whole oscillatory interference model is that it, it, it automatically, all of its flavors, um, is that it, it, it takes care of that velocity issue um, nicely. Um, I just throw that, I'm not even sure if that's addressing what you were just talking about, but it was, <laughs> it was related because we're talking about speed and velocity. Um, one alternate response is that actually, is that, um, if if speed change okay um you move quickly you move faster in some places than you move in other places and um and that's actually going to result in your grid cell map being warped uh if you use this learning rule your grid cell which, map would which, be kind which of, learning rule the, the one you um, just talked about yeah the using time as a supervisory signal uh and and um, Subita mentioned that uh, that once you bring in speed, it gets more complicated. Uh, but but the implication here would be if there are places that you move faster than others on average, the grid, the Euclidean space, whatever, uh, the, the sensory inputs are going to be mapped into the Euclidean space in kind of a warped way, where distance, spatial distance is not constant. And yeah, so I'm saying, I'm just saying that all the grid cell module models uh, involve oscillatory in interference uh, solve that problem. Um, you don't have that issue. 
I mean, I think the same is true with attractor models. Oh, it might I guess. Be. I, I guess I've just given up on attractor models. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not I, thinking I, about them. <laughs> Uh, uh, the more I get into, by the way, the more I'm convinced that the, 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 the oscillatory interference model has got such powerful uh, uh, stuff that, that, you know, that's why I was excited about the, uh, when Florian was presenting the hybrid models, um, you know, it just seems, uh, anyway, my current thinking is I'm, that's where I'm, I'm centered, I'm not thinking about that. Mike Hasselmo would be thrilled to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the thing I was, sorry. The thing I was trying to say with the last with these two bullet points was there's sort of a bootstrap. You can think of this as a bootstrapping problem or <laughs> opportunity where where the, both processes can help each other out. Where the flow helps you learn the map, the map helps you learn the flow. I, I think that's all right, but I think that's good. But I, to me, would, would you disagree then if I say you know? But it's a bootstrapping process. But I can really get started with flow. I mean, I mean, flow bits are a basis to build. A model and and then maybe you can go back and forth uh, as you go but the nice thing about the flow idea is that it applied to anything it just applies to any neural tissue right <laughs> it's like you know a column can be looking at another region of the cortex and it can apply the same principles um and it, it should work um anyway it just felt like um it was a very fundamental idea um so I, 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 I'm not sure I would agree that you could get bootstrapped without the flow thing. I think the flow thing could get you going and then maybe you could speed things up by reversing, you know, reversing it. Um, yeah, I guess part, a motivation here was that was like moving, to, okay, with sensory input, with our visual input, we certainly have these like fairly unambiguous flow inputs, especially if you have the whole visual field. Uh, you can imagine that might not be true in conceptual spaces. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Well, I, you know, it's interesting. That's a really interesting question. I haven't spent enough time thinking about it yet because I'm still just trying to figure out how to get it to work in the sensory spaces. But um, one, you know, it, it's an interesting cl couple of clues. We've always had this uh, uh, challenge to figure out what's going on um, with, you know, with this uh, layer five circuits of the thalamus. So, you know, layer, layer five cells in every, um, uh, every region project um, to thalamic relay cells, which project to the next hierarchical region. And we've always struggled to try and understand. And then they also sub, you know, so that's like a motor command, the layer five, if it does project subcortically, then it's a motor command, but I'm gonna argue perhaps some places higher in the cortex, it doesn't project subcortically. But, um, um, so then I'm, I, I'm getting at, there's some structural clues as to how to think about this in higher level regions. And, and so now I think about, now I'm thinking about those thalamic relay cells and I'm primarily thinking about them as these are the flow bits going through the, you know, these flow bits are going through the thalamic relay cells. And why, not, not just sensory bits, but flow bits. And, um, and what transformation would I do on these flow bits going um, into the, um, uh, yeah, to the next region. And, you know, motor commands are always gonna, you know, the, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of just uh, stuttering here a bit, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think there's some clues that we can use to figure out what's going on higher level regions. And I haven't really spent enough time on it, but I, I have a sense that, that we'll be able to figure it out if we, if even, even if thinking, just start thinking about it from a structural point of view, like what we know about these connections and what do they look like? What would a higher level column be observing at a lower level column? What kind of outputs would a lower level column have? And could we interpret those in terms of flow and and non-flow information. Um, anyway, I, I think this is a good, uh, I, what I'm seeing from you, you're presenting here, Marcus, is that uh, you're, you're interested, you're not, you're not covering this idea, you're sort of adding some uh, additional flavors on top of it. Um, Correct. Uh, which I think is nice. Um, and um, I, I would, I want to just reemphasize again, to me the, the, the there's several there's several problems that we have to address here that I'm still trying to get my head around. One is the transition from egocentric to allocentric spaces that has to occur. And, and then there's a question, does it occur within each region, each column, or does it occur between them? The second thing we have to do the compositionality thing, which is our displacement, um, idea of displacement cell. So um, uh, that same question goes there, is that happening within a column or between columns? And then, um, the last thing is the sort of the state of an object, which is so sort that of we have the same space of the object, but it's different states. We've talked about that. Um, so these are, these are three major themes we've talked about over the years. And 
um, and I'm trying to figure out how it is that a column can do those things or two columns connected hierarchically can do those things. Um, and you know, maybe I don't know the right one. I'm trying to solve them all at the same time. I don't know if that can be done, but that to me is like the, the, the really hard nut to crack here. Uh, and I'm hoping that this idea of a mini column movement space idea and upper and lower layers, um, and also the, the, the attended part being in the upper layer and the non-attended part being the lower layer um, could, could help figure out the answer to those questions. Uh, I'm just stating where my mind is at um, right now. And the problems I think if we're gonna work on this, those are the pro If you're gonna think about this, Marcus, and come up with some brilliant ideas, I'm trying to plant uh, the problems to think about. Um, Marcus, for what you're trying to present, uh, do you need a metric space for this, or would a topological mapping be sufficient? So the metric space that's that's created here by the by those simplest learning rules is uh, is average adjacency and time, or or average temporal distance between points. Right. Uh, but if, I don't know what you mean by topological map. In in other words. Um, when we, when we think about a metric space, we think of uh, somewhat absolute positioning in the sense that I could, you know, do, as Jeff was saying, trying to solve a path integration problem or something like that. If you're trying to show that these flows, you know, lead you from one place to another, but not necessarily, you know, in a way that if you did a circle around the thing, you would, you know, integrate to your starting position. For what you were trying to show, do you actually need a, a hard, metric space or would a topological space say if I head off in this direction I will connect with this thing if I head off in this direction I'll head in this this way as long as there's a rough idea that there's this kind of path through there but not necessarily it could be a very warped path you were talking about how speed was a difference in speed was going to you know corrupt your vision of the thing so I'm just wondering if there's a you know a, a less it's like you're saying Kevin like Oh, if I go in this direction, I'll get to the library. I have no idea how long it'll take me to get there. You know, it's just, something it's like in this that. direction type of thing. So, but, so, something like that, but in, in, in solving in the context of, of the space that you start. But, but if you're doing it, if you're doing that problem, like how do I get to the library from where I am? If I've never passed that, if I've never gone that direction before, if I've never observed and actually executed that particular from this location to that location, then I argue you have to have a metric space to do that. You can't. There's no other way of doing it. There's no other way of saying what's the distance and direction from here to point A to point B if I've never gone there, um, unless right. I have a metric space. But in, in, so I can make a callback. In the abstract spaces he was talking about, that's not necessarily necessary. If he's talking about a yeah, head. Uh, yeah, head, but I'm like saying versus. that's, a, that's I'm arguing that that's an essential characteristic of all cortex. And therefore, that's my argument. Like having other spaces that don't have that property to me or, or that seem like they're dead end. Well, it, it would seem that if you're requiring everything to operate that way, then you disallow the possibility that you could have two mechanisms, one of which tells you, you know, the topological connection and the other one operating adjacency to that. Okay, if I'm actually going to move my body through something, I will use both of them together, you know, so I'm just well. I guess I guess it seems to me that the metric space solves all the problems we need to solve. And so, if you want to have a different type of space, um, it might exist, but I don't know why I would need it. Uh, it doesn't seem necessary. If I have a metric space, I got, I can solve every problem. I'm not sure what a metric space and olfactory. A metric space, space would to be. me has got two things. You can take two two arbitrary points in the space and know the direction and distance between them. Um, so what about the case I just mentioned? Uh, which case? But I, I don't think, you know, I, the idea that I would know the direction, not the distance is, is not useful. I can't really. Ol olfactory space. Well, we, we, we don't think olfactory space is well represented in the cortex at all. And so we don't, we don't do anything with that. That's, we don't, that's not an, um, a cortical, um, you know, in humans, it's really poor. Right? And, uh, um, in this it's, it's, a, it's a subcortical thing, yeah. The cortex, yeah. at least in, in mo most mammals, doesn't it's have It's just a, like, you think about smell, you know, you, you can associate a smell with a location, but you don't navigate by smell. <laughs> you but can, if you're you to can liken, use a smell to, a, to, to imagine a location, and well, then you if, go, if right, you're but you don't say, oh, which way, which way should I move my nose to get there? It's like, nah. It's no, if, if you're trying to liken, you know, two smells together, there's some space in which you're trying to say this yeah, is Yeah, anyway, it's, odor is not represented well in the brain at all. It's all, as Supertai said, it's, it's mostly subcortical. There's very special organs for it. Um, 
um, and it, so we just generally don't think about it uh, in these contexts. It, it doesn't it doesn't fit the the, the sort of uh, all, almost all the things we think about is uh, touch and hearing and and, uh, and vision. So we should probably uh, uh, stop soon. Yeah, I yeah. I just it, I, just an interesting matter of protocol. I'm working on this as much as I can and until I get back from the own book again. I'm going to continue working on this. I'm totally happy doing it. I don't know if other people, how many other people want to participate in this and have these discussions on a more ongoing basis. I don't think we all have to do that. Maybe everyone wants to, I don't know. Um, I certainly don't want to distract from the main work of the company. So uh, we, this, we don't have to answer this question right now, but um, um, if, you, if, if anyone has any thoughts about that, like maybe we have a few people get together if, uh, separately or something who want to really talk about these things, then um, uh, we could do that or we could do it as a group and just do it less often. Yeah. I mean, I think we could do it in these research meetings. Um, okay. It'll particularly, if I mean, if you feel like it's it's not helping you, then we no, it's helping. It's definitely helpful. Uh, yeah, then we should do it. But you know, I you know, I'm just I don't you know, I could do, I could probably dominate every research meeting. <laughs> so <laughs> we have other things to talk about too, right? So um, well, the space. Well, I mean, now. we can we can deal with that one if that happens. All right, all right. Yeah. So I'll just assume we'll keep doing that. Uh, I do want to go over the um, the, the Moray pattern paper sometime. I, I don't think they're right in that paper, but I, it's fascinating to read, and it really taught me a lot about. Uh, it, it gave me a much deeper understanding of what's going on in all these oscillatory inference models. So uh, that's why it's fascinating. So sometime we can review that. Okay, okay. I'm gonna stop right. the recording. We'll